anytime you're talking about the Bengals, even though we talked about the run game, we know that the pass game kind of drives it. More often than not, they're going to have to make plays in the pass game. It is always a treat to talk football with my friend Greg Cosell from NFL Films and the NFL Matchup Show on ESPN. You did a segment on the Bengals' defense last week, Greg, where you talked about them as being too often overlooked. What stands out to you when you watch this group? I would say a couple of things, Dan. Number one, I think they have better players than people give them credit for. They may not have that one player. You know, what do we think of with defenses? We think of guys who get a ton of sacks. Now, I know Hedrickson had, I think, around 14 or 15 sacks a year ago, although he's not really talked about as a sacker the way some others are. Um, so he's not really mentioned that way. Um and, and more often than not, people talk about corners. If you have a great corner and they don't have that one guy that you say, wow, that guy is a great corner. Um, usually stacked linebackers are not discussed very much when, when people talk about defenses. Uh, they probably should be talked about a little more because I think they're really valuable. And I think that the, the Bengals have one really good one in Logan Wilson and another in Pratt, who I think is a really solid player. You know, I, I think you're dealing with two guys um, who are really good. Now, obviously when they go dime, which they do go dime, Pratt comes off the field. Wilson never comes off the field. Um, and they, you know, just like every team, they have different personnel packages based on nickel and dime. Uh, but I think someone like Sam Hubbard, again, another guy who's not going to have 15 sacks, but on this team and the way in which he's deployed, I think Sam Hubbard is a really, really good football player. And of course, we know about Reader inside. I mean, you know, there are certain guys who are just really good players who play roles that are important roles on teams that just may not put up stats and numbers that people take note of, but they're really good players. And I think Lou Anaramo does not get enough credit either because I think they do a really good job week to week being somewhat opponent specific in how they approach it. And I think that doesn't get talked about enough either. Lou has done a pretty remarkable job of confusing some great quarterbacks like Patrick yeah. Mahomes. Are there any unique concepts or anything he is becoming known for as a defensive coordinator? I don't know if there's a, you know, a Lou Anaramo concept that we immediately say that's his thing, but I think you just hit it right on the head. I think, and, and the Mahomes one is obviously the one that's most visible, but I think he does that pretty much every week in, in different ways. So it's not, Hey, there's one thing that you know, he's going to do, Dan, that you say, Hey, that's a Lou Anaramo thing. But I think he has a really good feel for opposing offenses, what their strengths are, how to get them into perhaps a limitation. And I think he does that really well on a week-to-week -week basis. I want to get back to DJ Reader for a second, because when he's been healthy this year, opponents have not been able to run on Cincinnati. It's been black and white statistically. What does DJ Reader do for this group? Well, as you know, you've been doing this a long time, college football, NFL. Stopping the run is not a sexy subject. People always think it's something, wow, they must be doing something amazing. Normally stopping the run, and, and Reader is really good at this, has to do with your first level defenders, you know, depending on the nature of your defense, one gap, two gap. There's always some of, of both depending on whatever defense you play. But what Reader's really good at is controlling and displacing offensive linemen. And that's essential in stopping the run. So again, it's not a sexy topic where you think, man, there's a great pass rush way. He just blew by that guy, you know, but he's really good at that. And when, when your interior D lineman can do that kind of thing, it really allows your linebackers to play faster because now they don't have to wait and see what's happening. They can immediately react. And I think you're seeing that with Wilson, why he often gets big uh, tackle totals. And But Reader is just really, really good at controlling and displacing offensive linemen. We're chatting with Greg Cosell from the NFL Matchup Show on ESPN. Let's turn to offense. You sent me your notes about Joe Burrow prior to the 2020 draft, and you had him graded as the number one quarterback in that class, and it's turned out to be a good class with Justin Herbert, Tua Tungo Vailoa, and, and Jalen Hurts. Right, you, right. you definitely got that right. Is there anything about Burrow in year three that's even better than you thought it would be at this stage of his career? The short answer is no, but I think he's improved in certain areas that he's been forced to improve in because of the nature of the team. I think this year he's gotten much better 
in understanding how to camouflage and compensate for some O-line deficiencies. And I think great quarterbacks do that. You know, it's always easy to say when a quarterback gets sacked a lot that they have a bad O-line. And, you know, and we're not going to lie here. We're not going to say that the Bengals have a great O-line or that they had one a year ago. But I think Burrow has developed sort of a more intuitive feel for how to deal with that, Um, whether it's getting the ball out, whether it's being better with his calculated movement, because Burrow is a sneaky athlete. And when I say sneaky, I don't mean, you you know, he's necessarily going to run for 100 yards, although he certainly can run for first downs if demanded. But just his ability to navigate the pocket, his ability to climb the pocket and find space, you know, a more quiet spot to deliver the ball. And he's such a quiet player. That's a word that I heard from a a quarterback coach uh, who was a head coach in the league for a number of years who I, I know well. And when he told me that years ago, it just really struck me about quarterbacks. Some seem even really good ones at times can see very active in their movement. Burrow looks quiet in his movement. Even when he's forced to move, it never looks hurried or frenetic. It looks quiet. And I think he's gotten such a better feel for that as he's had to, because you know, look, let's be realistic. This has not been a great O-line over the last couple of years, although I do think it's improved as this year has progressed because you would know this better than I, but I think those five have played the pretty large majority of the snaps this year, have they not? They have. Started every game together. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think there has been improvement. There's always some snaps where, you know, they just, certain guys get beat and that happens, but I think, you know, I think Burroughs developed a really good feel for that. And I think that's an improvement that he had to have. And because he's such a smart player and an intuitive player, he's developed that. Early this year, opponents were playing the Bengals pretty much the same way. A lot of two deep zones trying to take the deep ball away from Joe Burrow. Since week two, they're averaging more than 27 points a game. What adjustments have they made to attack that better, in your opinion? You know, when teams look to take away deep, you you have to think of it this way. If you're going to play single high, number one, a couple of things happen. One is you give up seams. Number two, there's outside the numbers throws that will always be there because a a single high safety is never going to get to make a play outside the numbers on a on a vertical type route. So and I think Burrow is an absolute master, maybe the best in the league at attacking one-on-ones outside the numbers. When he sees that, he throws it. Now, I don't know, and you may know this, I don't know how many of those are you know, checks at the line of scrimmage or play calls. That's hard for me to know watching tape. But I do know that when he sees one-on-ones outside the numbers with Higgins or Chase, he throws it. And obviously, Higgins and Chase are very, very good. Um, even with split safety, depending on what you do with your combination route concepts, Dan, you can still throw one-on-one outside the numbers because if you can eat up the safety to that side with a, with a route concept or combination route, you still get one-on-one outside the numbers. But if you're going to play split safety, there's one less defender underneath. Okay. It's a numbers game. Football is a numbers game. I learned that a long time ago from a veteran coach. So now you have, if you're going to rush for play split safety you only have three underneath defenders and that then becomes easier to attack underneath and I think they do a really really good job they're among the best in the league with what we call high low concepts they work between the numbers exceptionally well so they eat up an underneath defender with a low route um, whether it's the tight end it could be the back and then they run usually an in-breaking route behind that and if you're in split safety, you can't really play that route. You know, you, you have to play it top down. So the ball will be caught. And they do that with any number of receivers. They do it with Higgins. I saw them do it a few weeks ago before I got hurt with Joe Mixon. I forget who the opponent was out of an empty set. Um, which, by the way, I was going to ask you about this. Since the Steelers game, when they had 20 empty sets, they've not been in empty very much. And I've, I've been kind of surprised by that. Do you have an answer for that by any chance? Not so much, except to say that they've had so much success running out of the shotgun now. I mean, that's really become the key to the running game that I think they like having, you know, that threat to present to the defense. And it's cut down on the number of times that Joe's gone empty. That's a great point, because I think they knew that they had to become more sustaining with their run game. Uh, you know, because no matter how good Burrow and the receivers are, it's hard 
to be one dimensional every week and really win when you start playing good defenses. And that's a great point. You're probably right because uh, they need to develop some kind of sustainability with the run game. And they've been doing that out of the shotgun. So obviously that demands a back in the backfield. So they face the Buccaneers this week. Tampa Bay is 28th in the league in scoring, and it's not because Tom Brady is 45 years old. What problems are the Bucs having on offense? Well, they have a lot. I mean, and I say that honestly, you know, you know, everything I say is based on tape. You know, it's never anything more than that. This is a team with pretty significant offensive problems. Number one, they can't run the ball. Um, their first down run game is among the worst in the league. Um, this is a team that has faced on offense the second most third downs of any team in the league. They face 15 third downs per game, Dan, that you don't want to be in that situation. That's too many third downs on a weekly basis. Um, because defenses normally, normally have the tactical advantage when you're in third down, um, unless you're in third and one, third and two, and that's not the case with the Bucks. And quite honestly, Tom Brady has not played particularly well. He's very conscious of pressure. The O line has obviously been an ongoing issue. He's a pocket quarterback. He's not going to move. So he's become very aware of it, very conscious of it. He falls away from a lot of throws. He's not a guy that's going to take sacks. So he gets rid of the ball for incompletions, you know, just because he won't get sacked. So this is an offense that has multiple issues right now. The only thing you can say, and it could happen any given week, is they do have talented skill players. So could any given week be the week that they hit some big play touchdowns? It could. You, I mean, for your guys' sake, you hope it's not this week. But for the most part, when you watch that offense, it's they've got a number of issues that they're really struggling to work through. Defensively, on the other hand, they played pretty well. I think nine of the uh, 13 opponents have scored 20 or less in regulation. What do you think of the Bucks' defense and who stands out on that side of the ball? Yeah, they've had some issues in the secondary this year with injury. So that's, you know, again, um, I don't know what the situation is with you guys with Higgins and Boyd, obviously. But I mean, if 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 everybody's healthy, it's a little bit of an issue for the Bucks because their secondaries had some concerns. I mean, this past week they started Delaney as their slot corner, which and I know they don't want to do that. Um, so I don't know if he's going to be the guy again. I, I'm pretty sure Dean got benched at halftime of the last game because he did not play in the second half. And I don't believe he was hurt. He was the one who gave up the stutter go to Ayuk on the final play of the first half for the 49ers. So I think he was benched and he's been up and down this year. Davis is their best corner, their most consistent corner. Um, you know, their pass rush can be really good. Todd Bowles is a master of blitz concepts, and he can he can hurt you any given week with with a, a blitz that you haven't quite seen. And they'll be working on that this week because Burrow's incredibly smart. So Todd Bowles will want to show something that Joe has not seen on film. Now, Joe may be smart enough to recognize, hey, that's a different look. This guy's in a spot. I haven't seen him before. That's an alert. We may, you know, Joe's smart enough to know that, or he may not know that. You never know. You know, even the great ones at times get get confused by something they haven't seen. But this defense is, you know, last week they they couldn't stop the run. They couldn't stop the run at all with with the 49ers. So it's it's defensively they've also been really erratic as well. It's just been things have not worked for them this year really on either side of the ball with any kind of consistency. So the Bengals are looking for win number 6 in a row. What are a few keys in your mind to Sunday's game? Well, I think Anytime you're talking about the Bengals, even though we talked about the run game, we know that the pass game kind of drives it more often than not. You know, Joe doesn't have to throw for 380 for them to win, but but they're a passing football. I mean, even last week with Irwin in the game, with Taylor in the game, they both hit some big plays. Um, you know, they're they're a throwing football team. They're going to have to make plays in the pass game. Um, and And I think they can against this team. Now, the key is protection, because, again, the Bucks can rush the quarterback and and Bowles is a blitz defensive coach. So there is going to be pressure concepts that they have to deal with. So I think throwing the ball, they will have to throw it and they will have to make some big plays there. And then defensively. Um, and I want to mention one guy because I loved his tape coming out. But I think Cam Taylor Britt's going to be a really good player. He's competitive. He's feisty. He's tough. He brings a swagger to your defense. Um, you know, obviously a woozy, you didn't want to lose him, but you know, Taylor Britt is, is a really good player and he's going to be a starter there for quite some time. 
Bengals fans love it when I have you as a guest. I always appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you at the Combine in Indianapolis. And thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks, Dan. Really appreciate it. Anytime.